poker coach and coach who made the uh, six max GTO series. Just GTO. Won a big turnaround in ACR yesterday for about fifty thousand dollars. So congrats to him. Oh, I mean two day twos. So um, we have a two hundred fifty dollar day two and a hundred dollar day two coming up later today. So um, you know we're doing it. I guess we'll see. I made a day two last week that played Sunday, yesterday. <laughs> we were near the money. First hand of the day, I raised ace queen on the button off my 25 big blind stack. The big blind ripped it in for my 25 big blind stack. Obviously, I called the ace queen. He had the eight two offsuit and he beat me. I was like, oh, I'm glad I, glad I waited a week for this, this tournament where I had, you know, whatever it was, $4,000 in equity <laughs> right in the dumpster. That was a lot of fun. Took 12th place in a tournament that had about 3,500 people yesterday. That almost pays the bills, not quite. So that's that. What are my thoughts on online versus live poker? They're different games to some extent, but they're actually the same game. Just realize you're playing range versus range. Figure out what your opponents are doing and then adjust accordingly. You'll, you will just know way less what your opponents are doing online, which forces you to play good fundamentally sound poker, which is why you see these strong GTO players crushing online poker, whereas in live poker, the exploitative players still have a very, very good chance. I made day two in both of the million dollar tournaments. That's correct. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. I actually screwed up because I made day two of the hundred dollar one twice. I did not. So whenever I'm playing online, I just load up like every $50 buying game and higher. And... <laughs> Inevitably, what happens is sometimes you'll end up signing up for the same day two or for the same day one. So I made day one, day two of the hundred dollar one two times. And um, that's not good because it means you squandered one of those entries. Obviously, you just shouldn't have played the second one, right? Speak slowly. Um, I'm going to speak as I speak. Sorry. Today is the Poker Coaching Homework Challenge. That is accurate. That starts at 10 a.m. in 55 minutes. We're going to be going through a pretty cool spot. I'll read it to you right now. We're playing a $1,000 tournament with 40 big blind effective stacks. Everyone folds to the hijack, a good player who raises to two big blinds. You're in the cutoff. What is your strategy? Tell me what you do with your entire range. This is what we're doing at PokerCoaching.com in just about an hour. All right, suppose we call, we see the flop heads up, flop comes queen, seven, six, two hearts, and the opponent checks. What's our strategy? Which hands are you checking? Which hands are you betting? Suppose you bet 2.5 big blinds, the opponent check raises to 10 big blinds. What do we do? Suppose we call, turn is a 10 of spades, and the opponent jams all in for pot. Which hands do we call? Which hands do we fold? Bonus question, when the opponent jams, what are some key hands the opponent needs to be bluffing with for you to decide to not overbold the spot? That's the homework question for today. We'll be going through that in just a second. If you don't have access to PokerCoaching.com, you're missing out. You can get it right now at a very low price. Check it out at PokerCoaching.com slash Cinco de Mayo. That sale ends in 17 hours. So you better hurry up and get in on that. Do I personally have a warm-up routine? No, I don't have a warm-up routine because I know how to play poker very well at this point in life. And poker for me is not strenuous, difficult, something I have to get hyped up for, something I have to think too hard about, etc. So I just hop in and start playing. I made a video the other day where I recorded my entire online session. You all said you wanted me to play online, so I recorded my entire session. It was like 15 hours long. We had a second place and a third place in that session, so that was cool. Um, <laughs> it was my first time using Hold'em Manager 3, so I was trying to figure that out. It was... Um, it was a mess. I just like loaded up all the tables and just went. And that, that's how it goes. If you have any questions about the Cinco de Mayo sale, go to pokercoaching.com slash Cinco de Mayo. That will tell you all the things we have offered there because it's not just one thing. I know a lot of you are stuck at home with time on your hands and I want to make sure you do not squander your time. Do you have any problems cashing out? I haven't had the problem of having to cash out yet. <laughs> the nice thing about keeping almost no money online is that you don't actually cash out for quite a while. When will that video be available? I don't know. Eventually. I actually don't know if it's going to be the greatest video ever, but um, poker coach and coach Faraz Jaka said he did the same thing and it ended up being pretty good and he just cut out the dead time, so that was pretty cool. Is it possible to get access to insert any course as a standalone? No, all our courses are now part of pokercoaching.com. 
So if you want access to PokerCoaching.com and all of those courses, now is the time to do it. We're going to get a big discount. Jamie says, you really think the new Heads Up display course, along with the other study, has helped you a ton? You got to win in 180 person in a few final tables. Congrats, congrats. All right, so today we're going to be discussing letting your opponents have the chance to make mistakes. This is something a lot of people do not do, but I had two very big hands yesterday where I gave my opponents plenty of room to screw up, and they did, and it resulted in me having a ton of chips. Oh, someone asked um, how many chips do I have in these tournaments. Unfortunately, I only have like 25 big blinds in both of them. I actually had, I was like top 50 chip stack in the $200 tournament for a long time, but then I made a straight against a runner runner flush. Luckily, my opponent did not check raise me all in on the river because I would have paid. So that was cool. Since says, you want to turn it earlier today? Goodness gracious, everyone's winning all the money. Again, if anyone has any questions about the sale or upgrading or downgrading or canceling or renewing subscription, extending subscription, etc., send us email to support at pokercoaching.com and we will help you out. You raise the three blinds from the cutoff with King Queen of Diamonds, you get three bets and nine big blinds, you call, flop comes nine, six, three, he checks, you shove. Depends on how many chips you have. You didn't list very relevant information. If you don't list relevant information, then you can't answer the question. Chris says, should you sign up for Poker Coaching Standard or Premium? Listen, if you are not going to spend a whole lot of time working on your game, you really don't need a whole lot of resources, right? Because if you're going to spend like an hour a week, you probably don't need to get premium. But if you're actually going to try to become a very, very strong player, and you're going to work very, very hard to become the best you could possibly be, then you probably do want to get premium. So it really depends on what, how, how much time and effort you know that you have to devote to getting good at poker. Okay, so let's talk about giving your opponents a chance to make mistakes. First things first, small bets are very, very good. A lot of people think they're supposed to be betting giant with their best hands because they don't want to get outdrawn and they want to build a pot. The thing is, though, is that when you're playing poker tournaments especially, you really want to make a point to get full value from your hands compared to like pricing out your opponent or compared to trying to build the pot because you don't need to build the pot if the pot's already going to be big enough compared to your stack. The times you want to be betting on the bigger side is usually when you're deep stacked and when your hand is very susceptible to being outdrawn, but usually that's not going to be the case. Most hands are actually quite strong, and if they are susceptible to being outdrawn, the hands that can outdraw you make up only a tiny portion of your opponent's range. So you don't really need to worry about that. Um, I had a hand yesterday. I raised ace five offsuit from the button. The big blind called. Flop came six four three. So I've open ended straight draw. My opponent checked. I made a small bet, and he called. Turns a two, putting up a backdoor flush draw. I have the straight. He checked. Ask yourself, what would you do in this scenario? Well, stack depth is very important, right? That said, in this scenario, I believe the pot was already about um, seven or eight big blinds. The pot must have been out nine big blinds. And I had 20 big blinds in my stack. So I had about two times the pot remaining in my stack. Take a second, think about it. How much should we be betting in that scenario? The pot odds mean you have to be a payoff wizard. Pot odds exist and um, sometimes. I sure don't like holding. Okay, so in this scenario, you want to be betting relatively small. Pot was nine big blinds. This is a spot where I, as the preflop raiser, should not have very many fives in my range and the big blind should have a ton of fives in his range. So this is a spot where you really just don't want to be betting all that often to begin with. But whatever bet size you make, you want to give your opponent plenty of room to jam on you, right? So in this scenario, the pot was nine big blinds. I had 20. I think this is a great spot to bet something like three or four big blinds. Because if you bet bigger, it makes it to where your opponent doesn't really have room to jam. Like imagine we bet six big blinds, leaving ourselves 14-ish left. A lot of players in that scenario are gonna think that if they jam, I'm just gonna call all my sets, two pairs, over pairs, straights, right? Which should be the vast majority of my range in this scenario when I bet again on the turn. So in this spot, you you really don't need to bet big. A lot of people look at this and say, oh, there's a backdoor flush draw, I gotta be careful. Like, no, you don't have to be careful about a backdoor flush draw. That makes up almost none of your opponent's range. So the main concern here is giving the opponent plenty of room to make a mistake. If the stacks were deeper, we would bet bigger, but we don't need to bet bigger because we're very shallow stacked here. 
Because notice, if I bet um, three big blinds on the turn and the opponent calls, possibly go up to 15 big blinds, I'm going to have, um, what, 17 left? Slightly bigger than pot, probably not ideal, which is why I bet four, right? This way, you want to ask yourself, which size makes the most sense? If I bet four and the opponent calls, pots can go up to 17. I'm going to have 16 left. That lets, let us make a slightly less than pot size river jam, which will hopefully look kind of bluffy. So anyway, we did go the 40% pot bet. You're going to find that whenever you are shallow, your bets are more in relation to the size of the pot and the stack remaining compared to... Um, like your hand strength or like your overall equity in the pot, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, we did go small and the opponent jammed it all in. We gave him plenty of room to jam too. Don't forget that. When, if you bet big, like let's say you do bet two thirds pot, a lot of people just won't bluff. Don't, they'll only jam with value hands. So we did jam it. Opponent did, uh, I mean, I, what am I saying? Opponent checked, we bet small, he jammed. We obviously called, he had the king four for drawing dead. That was good. It's always important to try to get your opponent in drawing dead. That was, was that in that $200 tournament? That wasn't that $200 tournament. That actually got me up to like 100 big blinds in the tournament I made day two in. So that was fun. Then I made the, the straight and lost to the flush, so it didn't help me. But anyway, that was good. Only 21 people clicked the like button today. Well, everyone doesn't like all the like buttons. That's okay. You don't have to click the like button. I realize I can barely put a sentence together. That's what happens when you stay up playing poker until 2.30 uh, a.m., you inevitably can't put a sentence together the next day, which is not optimal whenever I have a poker coaching homework challenge to do in 45 minutes. But that's okay. I'm getting all the, the kinks out right now. It's pokercoaching.com, me on ACR. Yes. Um, okay. So small bets are very, 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 very good. Something else you should not do. You should usually not be raising with super nut hands that block good hands that your opponent could possibly have. So let's say someone raises, you call with pocket nines, right? Let's say the flop comes nine, four, two. Very, very dry scenario. So in this scenario, if the opponent bets and we have pocket nines for top set, we should usually not be raising. Yes, we are susceptible to being outdrawn by like ace five or ace three or whatever, but that's very unlikely, right? So we're not actually all that susceptible to being outdrawn. And in this scenario, most likely the opponent's drawing thin or dead. You could say, yeah, but he could have pocket aces and he'll pay us off. He's going to pay you off anyway. So this is a spot where when you're playing 50-ish big blinds deep, or maybe even like infinite big blinds deep, you really just don't want to be raising all that often. So that's a situation where calling makes a whole lot of sense because you really want to give your opponent a chance to make a pair with something like, um, you know, queen jack or whatever. Let's see. All of you are telling me you're winning all the money for the most part, except for Justin. You lost yesterday. Well, don't worry. I lost yesterday too. Actually, it's tough to know if you lose whenever you have these multi-day tournaments because like, I don't know what my equity is today. It's probably, uh, I don't know, 4000 bucks or so. So whenever you have $4,000 in equity, in theory, we're up, but we haven't cashed it out yet. <laughs> hey, we could, we could win all the money. Who knows? All right. Um... Something else you want to do is you just want to look for spots that don't make a whole lot of sense. So a hand I played yesterday as well, I raised with um, pocket queens from the low jack seat, small blind and big blind both called. Okay, I have queens, I raised from the low jack seat. Flop comes, king, king, nine. They both check. And in this scenario, king, king, nine, two diamonds. I have the queen of diamonds. In this scenario, we can either bet small or check. I think both plays are fine. Um, I don't think it really makes a ton of difference what you do in this scenario. It's a spot where a small blind, if they're competent, should have a whole lot of King X type hands. So you do need to be a little bit careful here. I think we had something like 30 big blind stacks. Yeah, we had something like 30 big blind stacks. So I didn't really want to bet and get raised. So I just check, check, check. Notice I'm not very susceptible to getting out drawn here. Um, obviously a Jack or a, not, Jack or a 10 could give someone a straight, but notice I blocked those really hard with the Queens, right? They can't have Queen Jack or Queen 10 all that often. An ace is bad, but, you know, whatever, there's four of those. It's not such a big deal. A diamond's not the end of the world because I have a queen of diamonds. So this is a fine spot to check, especially whenever you're, like, nearing a money bubble, especially when you're kind of getting to the later stages of the tournament. These are some tournament adjustments you need to make 
where um, you want to minimize the risk of going broke in exchange for maximizing value with your marginal made hands. Okay, so opponent checks, I check behind. Turn is a four, just complete blank. They check to me again. Now we have the best hand the majority of the time and I want to bet. Okay, so in this scenario, I decided to bet something like 75% pot. You're gonna find that this situation comes up somewhat often where it checks you on the flop and then you have a hand that's almost certainly best on the turn, but is, you know, slightly vulnerable and the opponents could very easily have a marginal made hand like a nine, like pocket tens, like pocket eights, like, like ace, queen, ace, jack, etc. So this is a situation where you do want to be betting and it just, just puts your opponents in bad spots. You could also bet here with just some very lowish equity hands like bad gut shots and whatnot. So I did bet big, 75% pot. Small blind folded, which is good. That was the main player I was worried about. And then the big blind ripped it all in. So pot was like eight big blinds. So I bet six big blinds and now the opponent jams for 30. Take a second, think about it. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Kevin, I'm not sure what you're referring to. The vast majority of my students are people who are wanting to try to become strong poker players and for the most part replace their income, their job, with income from poker. And a lot of them are succeeding. Didn't just GTO win the warm-up yesterday. He did. He won himself 50,000 bucks. Started, uh, started very early, ended uh, very late. So anyway, in this scenario, we did make a call. Something that led me to make this call, by the way, is the heads-up display. I have found that I have significantly better results on sites where there's a heads-up display because, well, it turns out having more information is good for the good players. And um, this guy who I was against had pretty loose, splashy stats. If our opponent in this scenario had very tight, passive stats, I would fold because tight passive players usually aren't jamming on king, king, nine, three with various draws. So that's a situation where it's very, very easy for you to fold against a tight player, but against the loose players, you should be way more inclined to call. So we called, he had ace, queen, offsuit. I was like, what? <laughs> what? It made literally no sense. And um, he didn't beat me. HUDs are for cheaters. It sure feels like cheating when you're using a HUD, I'm not gonna lie. Whenever you have a program that just tells you what your opponents do wrong, it's strong, it's a strong thing. I mean, if you look at um, a lot of the sites that try to be very recreational friendly, like Party Poker, like uh, GG Poker, they ban HUDs. GG has a, so GG does the thing interesting where they, where they give you a heads up display, but it's really bad and really like short term results oriented. Like they'll tell you, uh, how your opponent did in their last five tournaments. Like, that's any real indicator of their skill level. And I'm sure there are people out there just, like, looking at it. Like, like whenever people play Baccarat, you know, they keep track of what came out of the deck for the last five deals, and they... Or, like, you see people playing roulette where it came five reds, so now it must come... Must come, uh, you know, black next time, or must come red next time. Uh, it's tough. It's tough to say, like, what is fair. But, to be fair, it's important to realize... As long as something is within the rules of a poker site, it is not cheating and it's perfectly legal. Many sites have said that there are some programs that are not allowed. And that's fine. Sites are allowed to make up their own rules. Turns out, though, the more information you give to the better players, the bigger an edge they're going to have. And so if poker sites want to mitigate the edge of the pros, which means that you're not going to be able to become a pro either, you're going to win way less money, don't forget that. If poker sites want to mitigate the amount that people can win and make everyone's win rates get closer to break even, allowing them to just rake more money, well, you want to do everything you can to decrease edges. Which means make the tournaments turbo. That's how Poker Stars goes about doing this. They make the games very turboy and they also increase rake. Um, party poker, they get rid of heads up displays kind of accomplishes the same thing, but in a manner that feels way better because you may not necessarily see the edge going away. But anyway, turns out whenever you let good players use heads up displays, they will do better. Um, there's no heads up display in live poker, so why is it cool in online poker? Well, you use your brain and you pay attention, right? The neat thing about heads up displays is it allows you to play way more tables, which is why I'm sure PokerStars lets you use the heads up displays. 
because um, they essentially allow the pros to play many, many, many more tables. Not that this really matters. This is way off topic. If you're playing on a site that allows you to use a heads-up display, you should use a heads-up display. I mean, I, I have my heads-up display stats available for you. You can email support at pokercoaching.com. It's nothing fancy. Just you know, whatever. You can just send us an email. We'll send it to you. It's not, not anything advanced. And it, it will definitely allow you to make way, way, way better decisions. We have a whole series coming out right now on various poker programs you can use at pokercoaching.com. Check out pokercoaching.com slash Cinco de Mayo. Alex Fitzgerald knows all about all the programs, and he is um, in the process of making a long course on all that, so make sure you check that out. But yeah, if something is within the rules, you should do it. Just like um, before you play your poker session, maybe you have yourself a cup of coffee. Is that against the rules? No. Turns out it's not. Turns out um, playing more than one table at a time. Is not against the rules. Funny enough, playing more than one table at a time actually decreases your edge. So while everyone out there complaining about people playing lots of tables and being, you know, good players, realize that um, you actually hurt yourself by playing more tables. Yes, ACR currently allows heads-up displays. Poker Stars allows heads-up displays. Um, Bovada allows heads-up displays, etc., 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 etc. What time does the sale end today? Go to pokercoaching.com slash Cinco de Mayo to see. 17 hours. A lot of things you can just look up yourself. Please look up things yourself. Uh, the Push Fold app is down. Yes, the Push Fold app is down. It is available in the Android store now. So if you have an Android device, you can get it. Also, it should be available in the iTunes store very, very soon. Turns out getting a new app up in the iTunes store has been a big pain in my rumpus. All right. The first coach who tells the truth about multi-tabling. I kind of doubt that's the case. I mean, all this is pretty common knowledge, right? If you're playing lots of tables, you sure better use a heads-up display or play really, really, really good GTO poker. The problem is that when you play GTO poker, you actually won't have a huge edge. You'll have, you'll have an edge, but you won't have a huge edge, which is why people are still winning on the sites that don't allow heads-up displays. They're just not winning at a very high win rate. You think Poker Coaching Premium is the best training site out there? Um, mm -hmm. that's a tough question. It's either this or Run It Once, if I, just, if I had to guess. Run It Once has a lot of content, but it's not very focused. I think we do a better job of giving very clear, focused advice. I think if you are trying to get good at poker and you have time to devote to going through and studying and practicing, I think that we have the best site. Run It Once has a lot of the well, to be fair, we do too now. Uh, uh, Runner once for the longest time had a lot of the best players in the world making content. And they would do it in kind of like sporadic ways, like just hand reviews or them reviewing videos. Like, I like that kind of thing. I like seeing the best players in the world playing poker, right? And I don't necessarily need guided courses, right? But I realize the guided courses are what the vast majority of people need. And that is what we offer that basically no other site does, especially in a very interactive way. Poker Coach and Premium is definitely the best and most interactive. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm very hard on myself, right? I've subscribed to basically every poker training site because, I mean, that's part of my job. And um, it, it's either us or run it once. I mean, that, that's that's my honest opinion about it. And, I, and, like, I can look at the other sites and say that that's probably the case. There are downfalls to lots of sites, right? Like, Upswing's just generally very, very basic. Um, Masterclass is very, very basic, right? Uh, raise your edge is probably like too high level and too difficult to understand because they just try to be like super, super, super GTO. Um, I don't know what else is there. There's a bunch of other sites. Go, go check them out. Whatever. Find people you like to learn from. Find people you can learn from and study from those people and you will learn a lot. If you like me, learn from me. If you don't like me, don't learn from me. Learn from somebody else. Do whatever makes sense for you. All right. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Today we're discussing giving your opponents a chance to mess up. You all get me off, off topic. Um, you want to do everything you can to induce your opponents to mess up at some point in time. And usually that's when your opponents are very loose and aggressive or when they have a good reason to be very loose and aggressive, right? So if you know your opponent should be overly loose and aggressive, let's say because you're on a money bubble and they have a bigger stack, you want to do everything you can to induce them to make an error. Now, sometimes that'll cost you, but 
cost you, meaning sometimes that will result in you losing a pot because maybe they do something dumb. Like yesterday, when I raised the ace queen on the bubble, the guy jammed to the eight two offsuit and I called and I lost. You know, it cost, cost me money, but I made tons of equity, right? So that's a situation where you can use specific bet sizes to induce bluffs. And against most loose aggressive players, you're going to find that just using small bets will induce your opponents to make errors, especially on the turn in the river. If you want to get raised on the river, make something like a one-fourth pot bet on the river against someone who has very loose aggressive stats. Again, going back to leaning on the heads-up display. When I say loose aggressive stats, if you're playing against players and you're paying attention and you know they're playing lots of hands, well, those are people you want to be betting very small against and giving them every opportunity to do something absurd. Alternatively, you can induce folds from the tighter players. I, or the weaker players. You want to be using bets that make your opponents feel as if they are at risk. And if they are at risk, then they're usually going to start to become kind of tight. So bigger bet sizes are very, very strong against the weaker players. Some of you are commenting about the prices of various courses. I mean, look, people are allowed to charge whatever they want for whatever course they are selling. Just realize that I think the right way to go about selling content is to make it eh, generally affordable. And the reason for that is because information wants to get out there. And if you actually do care about helping lots of people, people, I mean, because everybody out there doesn't have, you know, $2,000 for um, a training course, like what a lot of sites try to charge you or, you know, $800 a month or whatever some of these people are trying to charge. It's um, very, very expensive for, for some poker training courses. And to be fair, that is still probably a value. You may say $800 a month, there's someone out there who has a training site where it's very, very hands-on, right? But it's 800 bucks a month. And um, I don't, I, I'm not, not a member of that one. I don't know anything about that one, really. But I'm sure it's good. And... You always want to ask, like, is that for me? Who is that for? And, you know, if you want to spend all day every day trying to get good at poker, if you spend 800 bucks a month on something, what is that, 30 bucks a day? I would certainly spend $30 a day to learn from any world-class poker player, right? Seems like a value. Um, like, take something like uh, Raise Your Edge. Good high-level content. I think they charge 1200 bucks, 1500 bucks, something like that, for, like, 10 hours of content. May seem expensive, but um, is it worth it? Worth it to pay hundred twenty dollars an hour to get content from good strong heads up or good strong online player? Probably, right? Um, the problem that a lot of those courses run into is that first off, they don't really add anything new to them. They're just like, here's my thing. I made my ten hours of content. I'm done, and then they they kind of forget about it. That that's the problem with a lot of those things, and. I think the best way to go about making sites and content to actually help people get good long-term is to continuously update and add content, which is what Runner Once does. That's what we do at Poker Coaching. And the problem is, is that that's actually really expensive to do. Believe it or not, we're paying thousands of dollars to these coaches every month to make the content for you. And it's a lot of work. And I get the idea that it's way easier to just make your 10 hours of content put it on the internet, sell it for 1500 bucks, and forget about it. Because, you know, somebody's going to buy it out there and I'm sure it's going to help them and it's probably a value for them. And it takes almost no work for you. So in terms of like just straight up maximizing hourly rate, that's definitely the way to do it. But if you actually want to help people long term and help them continuously improve, you need to be way more hands on, you need to be way more interactive, and you need to continuously provide content. And the thing is, is like, you can't charge $1,500 a month. I mean, I guess you could charge $1,500 a month. I could try that, see how it goes, but that would very quickly kill the market, which is why we charge um, you know, way less than that. Right now, go to pokercoaching.com slash Cinco de Mayo. You can get it for very, very cheap. And I, I think smaller monthly prices are probably better, assuming you're going to actively try to work to make your students better long term, as opposed to give them a thing and then be done with it. People ask me about, what do I think of this site? What do I think of this site? Look, I'm not going to go to every training site. We'd be here all day. Anybody can make a training site as well. Something something worth mentioning. I write, wrote this in my very first poker book. How long ago was that? Ten years ago. That anybody can write a book about poker. That does not indicate skill level. 
So you need to make sure whoever you're learning from is actually very good. And like I said, you know, they don't necessarily have to be the best player in the world if they're just easy to learn from. They actually teach you and help you get better at poker. And there are a lot of people out there, right? I mean, if you're playing, you know, two cent, five cent, no limit, you don't need to go pay thousands of dollars to learn from the best players in the world because, well, you can spend way less money, get good, solid information. Am I playing day two of the million today? I'm playing day two of uh, two million dollar tournaments today somehow. So that's fun. It is important to realize though, that just because someone charges a lot of money for something doesn't mean they're like trying to scam you or it's overpriced, et cetera, et cetera, because realize everything is not for you. I think that that's a problem that a lot of people have is they think that if something is, if something exists, they should have it, but that's just like not true. And if you are not gonna, like every, every, some things are not made for everyone. Some things out there are made for very specific people. The training sites that are $800 a month, those are not made for the vast majority of people. Those are made for like hardcore grinders who are gonna be devoting their life to getting good at poker. And I realize that is like almost no one, right? And um, I don't know. I, I don't need to be get, giving all of uh, all the other training sites out there tips on how to run their business and make more money and help more people. They can figure that out themselves. You think I have the best coaching site and the best price? Well, we do our best. You used to pay 250 bucks an hour for private coaching and you didn't even learn that much. I mean, look, private coaching is definitely the way to go if you can afford it, but like you said, it is expensive to get good private coaching. Okay, so yeah, give your opponents chances to mess up. The way you don't give your opponents a chance to mess up is usually to just like make them, like essentially you have to ask, what is the logical way my opponent is going to screw up here? For example, let's say someone raises and you have pocket aces and you just rip it all in, right? So say they make it two big blinds, you shove for 40. You have aces, it's a profitable play. They could mess up badly. They could call it off with the ace three offsuit, but are they going to call it off with the ace three offsuit? No, they're not, right? That's not the mistake they're likely to make. So ripping it all in with the uh, aces is a very, very bad idea. Instead, you should probably be three betting small, right? Because then every once in a while, you are going to get them to rip it all in with the ace three offsuit. You're getting them to call with the ace three offsuit and flop a gut shot and check raise you all in on the flop or flop a bottom pair or top pair, who knows, right? So you're going to find that you want to make sure that just because you are doing a profitable play, ripping it all in with aces is profitable. You're going to make money doing it. That doesn't necessarily mean it is the most profitable play. And the thing is, is that like how far down the line do you go? Obviously, you shouldn't be jamming too many, thing, too many things for 40 big blinds, but you're going to find that what a lot of people do wrong is let's say someone raises, someone calls, someone calls, someone calls, you call the big blind and it comes giving you a straight or a, a low flush or something like that. If it goes bet, fold, 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 and it gets around to you. Some people just shove it all in for lots of chips because they really don't want to get outdrawn when their hand is vulnerable. But in reality, what's going to happen is your opponent's just going to call with a very few nut hands that you're going to stack anyway, and you get them to fold all of their garbage. And you really want to keep them in with the garbage because those are all the hands that are drawing thin to dead. You always call a face queen suited versus 100 big blind three bet. And it's always queens are better. Yeah, you probably shouldn't be getting all your money in for 100 big blinds with ace queen suited. How realistic is eight big blinds for 100 at 25 no limit? It's realistic, I think. I mean, it's high. That sounds high, but it's realistic. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. How long do you have to be in a downswing before you start thinking about making changes to your game? You should always be making changes to your game. You should always be studying. You should always be aware of the spots where you have problems. Um, most people just play really badly when they are out of position as the aggressor, for example. That's the spot where like, even I, I struggle. Everybody struggles. Where you raise, middle position, let's say the button calls, and then the flop comes, connecting with their range, like queen, jack, eight. It's a tough spot. You need to be check raising sometimes. You need to be check calling sometimes. It's hard, hard to know what to do. So you always want to be studying all the scenarios that are giving you issues. 
You wanna be looking at your EV big blind per 100 if you're using something like Hold'em Manager to see if you are actually winning. If your EV big blind per 100 is something like three or lower, you should probably be moving down. You should probably be working very hard at your game. Um, you ideally wanna have something like eight EV big blind per 100 if you're playing the small and medium stakes. As you get to the higher stakes, something like five becomes pretty good. Um, unfortunately, ACR doesn't keep track of the buy-ins you play, but I'm playing you know, 50 to $2,500 buy-ins. I think my EV big blind per 100 since we've been doing this the last month has been like seven, which is, you know, fine. It gets muddled, right? It'd be nice if I could, if I could sort it by um, buy-in, but you can't do that. I, that's like, I'm sure it's lower at the high buy-ins and higher at the low buy-ins, right? That's how it works. But you want to make sure EV big blind per 100 is high. If your EV big blind per 100 is high, then you're fine. If it's not, then, well, you may have a problem. When am I going to do a live call-in show? You all may not know this. I have a thing called the Inner Circle. We may be wrapping it, or maybe slowing it down, or maybe we'll relaunch it, I'm not sure, where every two weeks, I do a live call-in show. The members of that show, or member of that um, group, they get to call in for 15 minutes and ask me about whatever hands they have. So uh, we actually already do that, but it is private. The problem is I can't just like have a show where everybody can call in because then we, you know, we'd, be, we'd be jammed. We thought the inner circle was done. It's still going. Uh, let's see. Speaking of poker coaching, I have a webinar going on right now. I have a webinar starting in 20 minutes. I should probably get prepared for that. They were reviewing a pretty rough spot where we get check raised on the flop. So yeah, I'm going to go prepare. If you're a poker coaching member, make sure you go there right now and make sure you're in the webinar. It's going to be a lot of fun. Should you follow the push fold? Wait, should you follow the push call range suggested when you have 10 big blinds or if the effective stack is 10 big blinds? For example, if you have the big stack, but the opponent has 10 big blinds. Um, it depends. You should, um, it depends on like an exact scenario. Like if the opponent jams for 10 big blinds and you have 50, yeah, you should follow the chart. Or if they have 50 and you have 10, yeah, you should follow the chart. The thing is though, it's like if they're, if they have 10 and then you have 50 and then everybody else has to act, yeah, to act has 50, you have to be calling a little bit tighter because you're going to get re-jammed on some portion of the time. How are you able to spot tells you may be giving off? You want to make sure you are relatively stoic. You should have your friends watch you. You should um, be aware of what you are doing. Is EV Big Line 100 relevant in multi-table tournaments? It is definitely relevant in multi-table tournaments. It is not as relevant in progressive bounty tournaments because it gets very confusing where like you should be trying to collect the bounty some portion of the time. Um, if you're a poker coaching member, go get the uh, bounty, the progressive knockout bounty calculator so that you never make mistakes calling off for the bounties, right? Um, so yeah, our World Series of Poker event's gonna start in a few weeks. No, World Series of Poker's been tentatively moved to fall, it's probably just going to be canceled. If you want to get serious at poker, should you get my tournament or cash game courses? You should sign up to Poker Coaching Premium. The Cash Game Masterclass is part of Poker Coaching Premium, yes. I mean, look, if, if you don't know anything about poker and you don't play poker, you need to figure out what games you even want to play. Tournaments are great if you can devote all day to playing poker. Like yesterday, I, I sat in this chair for uh, 13 hours playing poker. If that's not what you want to be doing with your time, then uh, tournaments are probably not for you. As a math coach yourself who teaches teachers, you can say I'm the best teacher out there. You've tried almost all of them. Thanks. Funny enough, I have a, uh, a coach who teaches me how to teach better because I'm not... I mean, maybe I am naturally pretty good. My, my teaching teacher says I'm, a nat I'm naturally very good, but I can be better. I'm making a tournament course right now. It's going to be big. And he's been going through all of it. We're like doing multiple takes on these. Like you all may not know this, but I do one take on everything. I do not like re-recording stuff at all. But I've done up to three takes on some of these, so it's taking forever. Um, you all wonder how I get so much content out. One take. So many people out there are like, yeah, I make I made this poker video. It's ten minutes long. I spend like uh, you know three hours per minute just getting it right. I'm like, I just run it. <laughs> I make a PowerPoint and go. Um, 
but yeah, so so I, I have people out there who help me. It's very important to realize that you are not the best at everything or perhaps anything, and you can always learn from others. Oh yeah, how long can you go on a downswing before you like get unhappy? For example, Lewis says you're on a 20 buy and downswing. 20 buy is nothing, man. Absolutely nothing. As a, a good way to look at like swings that you can experience, you can look at these re-entry tournaments online or like multi-day tournaments. Um, there was one on, um, what was that site called? Winamax. That was like a $33 tournament that you could re-enter without it had like 100 days or something. And one person was in 38 times without cashing. Obviously that person could be bad. The person who won the tournament, guess how many times they were in before they got their first cash? They were in 18 times, right? That basically means they bricked the tournament 17 times in a row. And that's just like... It happens, right? So realize that sometimes you're going to go on downswings. I personally have had two World Series of Pokers with zero caches. If you look at my Hinden mob, you'll just see, see two years where it looks like I just didn't even show up for the World Series. But no, I was there. <laughs> and basically, every high-stakes pro has had a World Series of Poker like that. It sounds crazy, but it happens. I was very lucky that both times I break the whole summer, I won a million dollars afterwards, so that was lucky. But you can still go on big downswings. So it's just normal. It's absolutely normal. And the way you do go on these big downswings is you just, like, you just lose all your important flips. I'm telling you, every day I went to the World Series, I would sit down, I would play, I'd play great, get about three or four starting sacks, get something like ace-king at the end of the day, get it all in, lose. Go home. <laughs> Show up and do it again the next day. And that happened like every day for 40 days. Um, so yeah, don't use, use that. What online site am I playing on? I'm currently playing, playing on America's card room. Cause that is the one that has the highest volume within America, but I would definitely not recommend that to anyone. That site is, um, pretty much the worst poker site I've ever played on. <laughs> it's pretty bad. So I would definitely not recommend you play on any site that is unlicensed or unregulated. If you do keep one day's worth of buy-ins in the site. Because at any point in time, they could go down and take all of your money. Please, 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 please protect yourself. Protect yourself. Protect yourself. If anyone is out there trying to say that the unlicensed, unregulated sites are safe and secure, they're almost certainly being paid by the site. And also, they are wrong. <laughs> Listen, I'm not paid by any poker site. I'm here to give you all good information to help you be the best you can be. And a great way to shoot yourself in the foot is to keep all of your money on an unlicensed, unregulated site. How do you feel about any other poker site? Is it unlicensed, unregulated? Then same thing applies. Any deep runs? Yeah, we made two day twos in these million dollar guaranteed tournaments. Yeah, if you're going to cash out from ACR, Bitcoin is the only way to do it. Why don't you like America's card room? It's unlicensed, unregulated. There are bots on it. They do not stop people from colluding. The site goes down. Two weeks ago, they had a misdeal. I've never seen a misdeal in an online poker site where they just stopped the tournament for five minutes because there's a misdeal. Um, they had a 420 smoke break. That seems absurd, where they would just like stop the games for 10 minutes in the middle of the day. Makes literally no sense. Anyway, anyway. What sites are unregulated? Come on, look, everyone, you have to do your diligence. I already made videos on this. I talked to my lawyer about this on YouTube. Go to YouTube. Go to uh, youtube.com slash poker coaching. Look for my most recent video with my lawyer, Mac Verstandick. He discusses those. Also go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash USA. And you have my thoughts on the main sites. Lots of people don't like the sites or don't, 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 like, don't like the truth. But when you're playing on unlicensed, unregulated sites, bad things happen. Remember, 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 history repeats itself. Eh, it doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but... It rhymes with the past. And basically every poker site that has operated within America has gone down at one point or the other. And when they go down, they very often just straight up steal the player's money. So don't open yourself up to that. Is ACR unlicensed? Yeah, of course it is. If it operates within all of America, it is unlicensed, unregulated, and they're definitively breaking the law. They had a 420 smoke break. That's awesome. 420 is symbolic among weed smokers. Yes, I'm aware. Yeah, I, I don't know how long they did this. When it, like the first three weeks I played, they had a 420 smoke break. They would just stop for 10 minutes. So absurd. Um, 
So yeah, that's gonna be it for today. We have a poker coaching webinar starting now. If you're a poker coaching member, go over there, click on homework. You'll hop right in it. Enjoy yourselves, have fun, have a great, great day. Make the most of your experiences right now. What's wrong with 420? Well, you just don't want to stop playing for 10 minutes in the middle of the day. It makes no sense. You want to maximize time and money. Maximizing time will maximize money and maximize value. Okay, 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 okay. Everyone's going off the deep and talking about online poker now. That's what happens. Everyone, you know, I mentioned the name of any, any online poker site. People say, oh, I play on that. Am I doing anything illegal? Or they, they say, I play on that site. I cashed out. It's good. Realize, just because you cashed out from a site does not mean that they are going to continue cashing out in the future. So many people send me emails. I've played on this site. I've cashed out two times. I've won on there. It must be good, right? No. No, it must not be good. All right. I don't know if I said goodbye today. I just want to keep talking to all of you. Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. I'll see all the poker coaching members in... Um, 10 minutes. Oh, oh yeah. If you want to become a poker coaching member in the next 10 minutes, oh my goodness, what's happening here? Go to pokercoaching.com slash single